Welcome everyone to this uh, session. Um, it's time to start. I'm Katharina and I will chair this session together with Christoph. Um, and I would uh, like to ask you if you have questions uh, during the talk um, to use the Q&A um, section on the right side of your screen. Don't use the feed or the raise hand option and we will answer the questions from the Q&A. Um, I would like to introduce our speaker for today, who is Etienne Becht. Um, he's joining us from the Ligue Nationale contre le Cancer, uh, Paris, uh, today. Uh, and he's going to talk about uh, infinity flow and uh, protein quantification uh, on single cell level. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, thank you, everyone, for, for attending. I'm very happy to, to be able to give this talk. Thanks to the organizers for selecting my abstract. So I'm going to talk about uh, this technique, Infinity Flow. It's a combined uh, experimental and uh, computational approach that kind of uh, augments flow cytometry to turn it into a technique that can uh, let you profile hundreds of proteins uh, across millions of single cells. Um, so for those who are unfamiliar with flow cytometry, I'll give you like a very, very simple explanation. Uh, the way it works is you stain a cell suspension with antibodies a set of selected antibodies that target known uh, uh, proteins. And then you run this cell suspension through flow cytometers and that lets you count uh, the number of uh, antibodies on each cell and that kind of lets you pr um, estimate the uh, expression of these selected proteins uh, on your single cells. And it has very high uh, cellular throughput. However, as, as I said, the number of uh, proteins is limited that's kind of a problem is because if you want to uh, to profile very complex uh, settings, for instance, if you look at the here the immune response to cancer, or it can be any other uh, complex tissue, uh, there are a lot of different cell types that are involved. Some are very abundant, some are very rare, and they can interact in all sorts of crazy ways. Uh, so, for instance, if you if you're an immunologist, you're familiar with uh, CD molecules, and there are currently close to 400 CD molecules. So. That's much, much more than what uh, flow cytometry is currently capable of accommodating. So if you want to uh, get an in-depth uh, perspective on these kind of uh, complex tissues, uh, you can't really use uh, flow cytometry. And are other uh, techniques uh, more suitable? Well, they all have uh, pros and cons. And uh, in general, there is a trade-off between uh, the number of parameters, the number of proteins you can measure per single cell, and the cellular throughput of the assay. So that's a problem because if you want to profile many proteins across many cells, uh, you don't really have a technique that lets you do that. And in addition, I think uh, flow cytometry is uh, currently uh, very uh, widespread. It's common across many institutions. But uh, these other techniques, they are still a bit rare. Uh, they can be more expensive or require expertise. So I think there is a, a need for a technique that's both high parameter, high cell throughput, and uh, widely available. Uh, so the technique I'm going to present today, I think, uh, achieves that. So I'm going to tell you about uh, how it works, uh, both experimentally and computationally. Uh, I'm going to tell you how you can use it to profile complex tissues. And finally, I want to discuss uh, limitations because I think it's uh, very insightful to also discuss limitations to have a better understanding of the technique. Uh, so first, uh, workflow. Uh, in terms of experiments, it's, uh, it starts very similarly to flow cytometry. So you have your cell suspension and you label uh, this cell suspension with a panel of antibodies. And in this context, we call them the backbone antibody. So I'm going to use this term a lot. Uh, we call it backbone because it's really going to support uh, the entirety of the experiment. So the backbone panel is uh, pretty much like your uh, conventional flow cytometry panel, like nothing very weird here. Uh, but then what happens is you uh, split your cell suspension across 96 well plates. And at the bottom of each well of these uh, plates, you have a single uh, antibody. I mean, you have antibodies with a specific, uh, that are specific for a single protein. Um, so I'll come back to that in a bit. But uh, the nice thing about this uh, experiment is that it's actually commercialized by a variety of vendors. Uh, which make it uh, quite cheap to run and quite easy to run. Um, so in terms of staining patterns, what you obtain is that your backbone uh, panel is staining every cell in every well. So here you typically want to use well-characterized markers to include in your backbone panel because these will let you uh, define cell populations. 
And then you have these exploratory uh, antibodies that are unique to each well. So you have CD1 in the first well, CD2 in the second, CD3, the third, and all the way to CD300, schematically speaking, of course. And so then you just acquire this data using uh, conventional flow cytometers. So the experimental workflow, I think, is relatively straightforward, but uh, although these assays, I think, they've been commercialized for a few years, they haven't really taken off. And I think one of the reasons is there is currently uh, no uh, very good software to help you analyze it. And the data analysis is a bit frustrating, I think, uh, because it's straightforward to look at the backbone, so the, the, the antibodies that are common across the whole assay, but you also kind of form to use these exploratory antibodies to help you define cell populations, for instance. But you can't really do that because uh, if you have 300 markers, only one cell in 300 is going to be labeled by a particular exploratory antibody. So the, this exploratory data is very, very sparse. Uh, however, the, 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 how we solve this, help, help solve this problem uh, is that we, we use the fact that the backbone is measured everywhere. And uh, what we do is we train in each well, we train uh, nonlinear regression models, uh, trying to predict uh, the uh, expression of these variable antibodies from the vector of uh, backbone uh, antibodies expression. Uh, so these models, after they've been trained, they let you uh, estimate the, the, the expression of these variable antibodies uh, throughout the whole assay. And you can do that for every well. So basically, uh, instead of all these uh, missing data, you end up with a dense matrix of imputed data of every protein across every cell in the assay. That's a bit uh, abstract, maybe. So let's look at an example. Uh, this is a, a very tiny uh, portion of a data set I'm going to tell you more about later, but here we are only looking at 1,000 cells and uh, only 10 exploratory markers. Uh, so the top part is actually the backbone panel here, and I've just run some uh, simple hierarchical clustering to reveal cell populations there. And uh, what's interesting is now if you look at the second uh, row of markers, these are uh, the first 10 exploratory measurements, uh, exploratory markers. So as I said, they're very sparse, represented here in black, but if you look at the colors, you can see some patterns appearing. For instance, you have some uh, yellow there, which suggests that this cell population is probably uh, expressing this marker quite highly. And uh, so what this tells you is that when you uh, look at the structure that's present in uh, your backbone, it also correlates with some structure in the exploratory measurements. In, in a way, all these models do is they uh, try to uh, model these relationships between backbone and exploratory measurements and use them for imputation to predict these missing data and, and, uh, and get a single cell protein expression. I think the single cell aspect is quite important here because that way you don't need to rely, for instance, on clustering to analyze your data. You can directly look at the continuous uh, expression vectors of predict predicted expressions. So that was for the uh, general idea. So now let's look at uh, an actual data set. I'm going to talk about uh, the mouse lung. We provide uh, lung from uh, uh, black six mice. And we provide uh, in the data set I'm showing uh, 2.6 million cells across 266 markers. And uh, first, uh, let's, let me tell you about how cytometry data is commonly analyzed. You look at pairs of markers. And you just uh, select uh, areas of uh, high densities in the bivariate distributions of these markers. And you uh, can further drill down into your data set this way to define more and more uh, precise cell populations until you can uh, name them. So that's uh, typically called manual gating. And now, if you look at how uh, this correlates with unsupervised techniques, such as uh, non linear dim dimensionality reduction using UMAP, uh, for instance, you can also use TISNI, of course. Um, I think there is one thing that's very reassuring, uh, um, is that the two are somewhat consistent, like the populations you define using manual gating, they end up as uh, clusters on your, your map and uh, everything's fine. But what's a bit puzzling is you have all these cells here represented in black, and these are structure in the data, these are kind of clusters. Uh, they exist in the data as kind of separate entities but our manual gating completely fails to inform upon them. So the, the patterns are there, we just don't know how to interpret them. But with the infinity flow approach, you can make use of all these uh, expl exploratory measurements to help you label your uh, clusters further. So here I've run some uh, clustering using the phenograph uh, algorithm on top uh, on the, of the data set. And uh, actually we were a bit uh, surprised that we were able to 
uh, we obtained 33 clusters and there was only one cluster that we couldn't put a name on uh, and all the rest we managed to label. We were very surprised, for instance, to find ILCs, basophils, uh, PDCs in these data sets that are really rare and that we really didn't expect to observe. And we also observed, for instance, some heterogeneity in the non-immune cells uh, with uh, first endothelial, mesenchymal, and epithelial cells, and even multiple subsets of uh, epithelial cells. So uh, again, this is all, uh, maybe in this er era of uh, single cell RNA sequencing, it's not that surprising, but I think using conventional flow cytometry, it's very impressive to uh, be able to get that broad of a profile using a technique that's only uh, profiling certain proteins in the backbone in this case. <clears throat> um, but the, what I just showed you, in a way, you don't really need to do imputation. To do that, you could basically average the export of measurements across clusters. But something very unique that uh, the regression lets you do is, direct, uh, is to directly look at uh, co-expression patterns between your markers. So here, I've just selected six uh, by uh, six uh, pairs of markers, and you're looking at the, their joint distributions there. Uh, not particular cherry picked. If you're familiar with uh, flow cytometry, but like uh, common uh, regular flow cytometry that uh, comes out of the flow cytometer. And so that's, I think, a very important thing in this pipeline is that it takes in FCS files, which are the common file format for flow cytometry, augments them with the machine learning approaches, and uh, spits out a new set of FCS files that people can then load into their favorite uh, uh, analysis tool and uh, kind of analyze their, themselves the way that they typically uh, analyze this type of data. So we've made the data set uh, I'm talking about now uh, available for you to download both the raw and the process data sets are available if you want to explore the data yourself. And as I said, this is only a very tiny fraction of the data set. Here is a kind of complete representation of it. So you have 266 markers, uh, all overlaid on the same new map. So I'm, of course, I'm not going to go into the details, but you can see uh, that you get a lot of information about a lot of different cell types. So if you want to uh, generate hypotheses on a, on a, in a biological setting you're studying, I think it's a, it's a very good technique to do that. Of course, this is all uh, imputed expression. So if you're a skeptical person, you probably wonder, like, does it actually work? Are the prediction trustworthy? So let's discuss that a little bit. Um, so here I'm showing for uh, uh, 12 markers that are sampled across the whole range of performance from the ones that work really well to the ones that really don't work. Uh, measured expression versus predictive expression. So of course, we want them to correlate. And I think the take home from this is that for roughly one third of the markers, uh, the predictions work really well. And these are typically very bright markers with, that are very frequently expressed. And then for another third, you have markers that are a bit dimmer or expressed by fewer cells. And I think in this case, like although the metrics are a bit uh, worse, uh, in the end, the, the, regression, the regression works quite well in the, in the sense that it recapitulates what you really care about, which are it, it finds positive cells and uh, considers the negative cells actually negative. And then you have roughly uh, another third, a big third, honestly, that uh, don't show much signal. So in, the, in this case, the regression seems to fail, but it's mostly back because the staining uh, in the first place doesn't work. I think that's because it's quite hard to experimentally get all the antibodies to work at the same time. Um, but uh, it's not really a problem of uh, the computational approach failing. And um, for a small subset of the antibodies, actually, the, the regression is actually uh, to blame. So I'm going to come back to that uh, at the end. And uh, in terms of what machine learning uh, model to use, maybe you're wondering. Uh, we tried a few. We tried the gradient boosted trees, uh, neural networks, support vector machines. And uh, bottom line, they kind of all perform similarly. It doesn't make much difference. I think that's actually a good thing because that means that this problem, it's not too sensitive to the choice of model you're using, the choice of hyperparameters you will be using. So this pipeline, you can kind of use it out of the box, and you don't really have to fiddle too much, fiddle too much with the parameters. And another interesting thing is if you look at this model in orange, that's a linear model. And you can see that these uh, modern nonlinear machine learning approaches, they work much, much better than these traditional regression models. And if you want uh, actually a, a linear model that competes, uh, 
we actually generated like third degree polynomials from our data. So that's 1000 covariate, it's a huge model. And then it kind of comes close, uh, at least on these quantitative metrics to, uh, to these machine learning models. Uh, so that's uh, how, how much nonlinearity you need in a way. Uh, something that uh, everyone's, uh, everyone I've processed data for has tried to do uh, is take the augmented data and then try to run uh, some downstream algorithms on it. So for instance, ZMAP uh, or TISNI. And uh, I want to discuss whether that's a good idea or not. And so first, let's look at uh, how it goes. So here you have the, the backbone ZMAP I was showing you earlier. I'm highlighting a couple things. And I'm going to show an animation transitioning from the backbone UMAP to uh, UMAP on the uh, augmented data. And you can see that some cells move around. And for instance, you have the CDC1, so uh, dendritic cells of type 1, that move closer to their related cell types. I think that's because we profiling hundreds of proteins. We kind of have a less bias selection of feature. And therefore, uh, we have the phenotypic uh, distances that are a bit more um, um, consistent with ontology. And second thing I want to highlight are the B cells. Um, so if you look at the backbone UMAP, you kind of get one single blob with no particular substructure. If you run a UMAP on the augmented data, you end up with this, uh, basically two subclusters of B cells. And here I'm highlighting a few markers that were identified. And we are very happy to see that these B cells subtypes, they had been described recently in the literature. So we kind of confirm uh, their existence. And we, again, we are very surprised to uh, be able to find them using conventional flow cytometry. And, and the backbone, so basically, the backbone we used was not particularly designed for this approach. But uh, by running this pipeline, we got all this extra information for free. Um, and that, that was kind of a surprise to me, because if you think about uh, how the pipeline works, you start with your backbone, you fit your models and then you impute data, but everything comes from the backbone. So I was thinking that uh, analyzing the backbone or analyzing the augmented data would be pretty much the same. And the reason I think this is not the case is uh, because these models, in a way, they are crafting new features. Uh, these are supervised models. Uh, they learn the exploratory measurement from the backbone, and in this way, they craft new features that are biologically informative. So as an example here, I'm showing uh, one channel, complicated channel in our experiment. There are eight antibodies that are multiplexed in this channel. And uh, I've annotated cell types uh, a posteriori here. And you can see that there are subtle shifts in the expression of this uh, multiplex channel for these cell types. And using uh, these subtle shifts, plus, of course, the information contained in other channels in this experiment, the machine learning models, they turned uh, this, this uh, multiplex channel. And were able, uh, they were able to uh, deconvolve uh, this multiplex channel into its constituents. So you, you go from something that's very messy, uh, like this, to uh, new features that are very simple to interpret. So if you want to find B cells, you just look at the predicted uh, CD19 positive cells, and you can do it for all the constituents. And I think that's why uh, analyzing the augmented data is much, much cleaner, both for human analysts and using also unsupervised methods. Uh, so very briefly, we already published some papers, although the methods paper is still being reviewed. We published some papers uh, using it in the bone marrow to find uh, new markers of developing neutrophils, committing neutrophils. This was a collaboration with Emmanuel Kwok and Lagwan Eng in Singapore. Uh, so I'll skip a little bit. And uh, we also used it to find uh, new markers differentiating conventional monocytes and uh, dendritic cells of type 2 in the blood uh, of humans. Uh, there were no very good markers at the time. This was with Charles Antoine Duterte and Florangino in Singapore also. And finally, in the last couple of minutes I have, I will talk about uh, limitations. So uh, I'm not going to cover every limitation, but two that I think are very uh, easy to explain and important. Uh, the first uh, is, uh, as I was saying, some markers, we, we see expression, but the models fail to predict them. So here I'm showing examples. And you can see that for this TCR spectrotyping antibody, so basically these are kind of T-cell clones, uh, although not exactly, but kind of T-cell clones. And you see we have positive staining that you can see here on the bars. Uh, but we, uh, we the models, they predict that these cells are actually negative and not positive for these antibodies, although they should be. And the reason for that is that the backbone we use is completely orthogonal to the expression of these markers. So the, the machine learning models, they are not black magic, and they can't uh, 
uh, do imputation correctly in this case. Um, and um, another limitation, I think, uh, um, since you have to split your sample uh, across the number of wells that you have, uh, you need to use more cell that for a than for a conventional uh, flow cytometry staining. And although I don't really have experimental evidence to uh, answer how, how, how few cells you need, uh, here is an example. We are looking at uh, the population of basophils. This is a basophil marker. And we've tried with as few as 1,000 cells for training the model. So that's just eight basophils out of 1,000 cells. And some models were actually able to find the populations quite nicely. So at least computation, computationally, you don't need that many cells uh, for this approach to work. Um, so in conclusion, we developed this new package, uh, Infinity Flow. It's part of Bioconductor 3.12. It uh, lets you find uh, profile lots of proteins across uh, lots of cells, and it just uses flow cytometry, which is uh, widely available. And with that, I would like to thank my mentors, collaborators, and colleagues for their support and help. And I thank you very much for your attention, and I would be happy to answer any questions. I think you also have questions. Um... Christophe, if you want to take take over. Yeah. So uh, Ricardo asks, uh, well, says, impressive work, and then asks, are all relationships uh, established in the amputation model represent the diversity of cell states? And I can imagine that some proteins may be correlated only in specific contexts. Uh, so I agree. Uh, so I think there are two parts in these questions. Like first, uh, Cell states, to me, that evokes like very continuous uh, identities of cells. And I think that's very accurate in this case, because again, we're not doing clustering. We're doing regression. So we're predicting everything on a continuous scale. Um, and in a way, that's, a very, uh, that's very consistent with the idea of a cell state. Uh, you can run clustering, but that's kind of a posteriori to this pipeline. And uh, the second part to this question, I think, uh, is uh, that these relationships, they may not extend to new biological contexts, and I think that's very true. So everything I've showed is like for one uh, biological setting. And of course, if you take the models and apply them to a new data set, you may get something very stupid. So I think it's a very interesting avenue of research, actually, trying to get models that would generalize to new data sets. But uh, this is something I would love to work on in the next couple of years, to be honest trying to, for instance, generate a lot of uh, data sets like that and try to get models that are uh, that you can extend to new. I mean, that would be more general. But for now, it's it's kind of a pipeline to analyze this type of data sets. And uh, it, it's not meant to uh, generalize, also, but it's very interesting to do that. OK, great. And then um, you, Johannes is asking, uh, is there a specific need to only use one exploratory marker per tube? Yeah, so that's a, so there are also, uh, there has been a paper, for instance, in Immunity looking at B cells recently that kind of used a lot of panels that were partly overlapping and try to merge everything. Uh, so there is no uh, need, strictly speaking, to only use one, but I think it simplifies things uh, a lot. Uh, here we are using flow cytometry, and something I didn't really have the time to discuss is you have a spectral uh, overlap between channels in flow cytometry. So if you use two different uh, variable antibodies, uh, it may get very hard to um, prevent interactions between your variable channels and the backbone. Because something also I didn't say is that since we're doing regression, it's better if the uh, target you're trying to uh, predict doesn't, uh, in, there is no interference between the target and the, uh, the variables you use to predict. And if you have crosstalk, uh, so the spectral overlap is a problem in flow cytometry. Mm -hmm. uh, then it, this approach, I think, would start speeding up rubbish. So I think okay. uh, for two reasons, like the kits, it's only one marker per tube, uh, so that's practically uh, nicer. And for the regression to work, it's probably easier with one marker per tube. Okay. Do you, do you use compensated or uncompensated? So compensated for spectral? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So I think you don't need to use uh, compensated data actually for the regression to work. And actually we've tried a bit with uncompensated and you, you technically speaking, you don't need to, uh, to compensate. You just need to make sure that the, 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 the fluorophore you're using for the uh, variable antibodies is perfectly isolated. So you need to compensate that channel at least, but for the rest, it doesn't really matter 
uh, because the, I think the machine learning models, they don't really care whether it's compensated or not. I think we have time for one. That's the one unanswered question. Uh, can you comment on the cost of infinity flow with respect to other platforms? Yeah, so uh, I can't discuss like uh, every other platform, but uh, what I know is when we run these assays, it costs uh, somewhere around $2,000 uh, for one assay which is not so expensive, I think, considering the, the amount of information you get. Okay, so thank you very much. In the interest of time, we will um, go into the break now. I, I guess Etienne is still around on the platform. You can yep. certainly write him questions. Um, <laughs> and thanks again for the nice talk. Yeah, thank you very much. New novelty aspects, which I'm very happy about. And um, see you soon.